What got me hooked on Zorro was the fascination of this handsome, romantic, swashbuckling man that had a dual identity, was foppish by day, hero by night. The biggest thing that differentiated Zorro from the other Westerns of the time was the humor of the series. It wasn't just the good guys, the bad guys, it was real people. Zorro had a great moral compass and felt a sense of responsibility to right wrongs. So he wasn't a superhero, he was an extraordinary hero. Zorro made his first appearance in a pulp magazine, All Story, in 1919, in a serial that went on for five issues called The Curse of Capistrano. Johnston McCulley had been writing for a long time, but this was the first time he wrote about Zorro. And of course, Zorro became his greatest success. It was brought to Douglas Fairbanks Sr. attention. Now he, of course, at that time, was one of the, if not the biggest male star in pictures. So they did the film, and of course he's marvelous in it, and he plays this Don Diego, who is this very weird young man who is constantly going like this. And then of course he changes into Zorro, where he's Mr. Leaping Balding Everywhere. When it opened in 1920, the audience loved it, and it did great business. The Mark of Zorro was the title of Doug Fairbanks' movie, not The Curse of Capistrano. Now, when Johnston McCulley continues on, he's calling things Zorro. So when the book comes out, it's called The Mark of Zorro. And what it is, is really the transposition of the serialized version in All Story magazine to book form. Johnston McCulley had written a sequel, Return of Zorro. Then comes a series of serials that Republic does, and a couple of other features. Zorro's Fighting Legion holds up terrifically, and the action material is marvelous. Suddenly, Daryl Zanuck at 20th Century Fox thought, wait a minute, how about Tyrone Power in The Mark of Zorro? The Tyrone Power version turned out to be extraordinarily popular. A long time ago, there was a masked rider who rode the countryside. This was in old Spanish California, back in the days of high adventure and low, soft guitar. Disney originally thought of doing Zorro in 1952. They purchased the rights from Mitchell Gertz, who at that time was the agent for Johnston McCulley. Disney pitched his idea to the two networks, CBS and NBC. They wanted him to make a pilot. Disney felt as though he didn't need to make a pilot. He knew how to make films. So the negotiations between three were cut off. And it really wasn't until early 1957 that they began to work on it again. Zorro was the project at the studio in 1957. It's what everybody was involved in. Marvin Davis designed the sets. The set was the first standing set built on the Disney lot on about six or seven acres at a cost of about a half million dollars, which in late 1950s dollars was a lot of money. Walt Disney was a big fan of this project, and he supervised every bit of it, and pulled out all the stops on it. The fact that Walt wasn't a TV man and he wasn't used to dealing with TV budgets really worked out to our advantage because he brought film to television. He was very determined that everything would be like an exact replica of the time and he was very specific in regards to the wardrobe and the hairstyles and the jewelry and all of that. It was stepping back into a time that I'd only read about. Walt was very involved at the earliest stage of the show. At the time the series actually got on the air, he was very busy. He had Disneyland, he had the Mickey Mouse Club. So he really turned it over to a team that he was comfortable with, people like Norman Foster. Norman Foster really set the tone for the series. The melodrama, the action, some comedy, some music. This was kind of the Disney formula. Disney loved to have all of these elements in his productions. Norman Foster who was also instrumental in casting the show. Prior to Guy Williams, the public's last Zorro was Tyrone Power. Power was a good Zorro, but I always felt that Guy Williams was a little bit better Zorro. Next time, you may not be so lucky, Comandante. Foster helped make some changes with the Don Diego character. Don Diego! Oh, Sergeant, uh, what are you doing here at this hour? Don Diego was always played in the past as being a slightly effeminate character. 
Guy Williams said that he thought it would be tiresome for people to see that kind of character week after week. So they made him what Guy called just a regular guy. Instead of a man of action, I shall become a man of letters. That was a big thing that Foster was able to establish. Walt Disney's dedication was to excellence, so the finished product to him was everything. Each episode of Zorro cost approximately $78,000, 39 episodes a season. And those were shot on a five-day schedule, which was really extravagant for that period of time. And it really shows. It has a real film look to it. What impressed me the most about the show was the fact that the actors all worked together so well. They were a true ensemble, and so the whole air on the set was that of adventure and fun. The casting of Guy Williams was incredibly crucial to the success of the show. He really had a personality for that character. Guy Williams brought an incredible presence to the character. His broad smile and his dashing good looks, he had a great spirit that just comes across on the camera. Henry Calvin was a jovial human being. When he would enter a room, the belly would kind of come in first. Henry Calvin had been on Broadway. He was an operatic singer, and he played comedy very well. Although he was working for the villains, he was not a villain himself. He was somebody that you just usually felt sorry for because he would always take the brunt of Zorro's kidding or usually end up with the mark of the Z on his pants. I have a genuine affection for Sergeant Garcia Padre. At heart, he's a good man. Gene Sheldon was originally a vaudeville actor and a clown and a mime. Gene Sheldon, who was Bernardo. The blind man went on, and you followed. They used to tease each other all the time. Guy Williams would say, you know, I should get your paycheck, too, because I have to do all your lines, too. <laughs> George Lewis, who was cast as the father, was also a very solid performer. The Indians are torn from their families and forced into slave labor, all for the benefit of one man, Capitan Monastar. Britt Lohman's Captain Monasterio is just wonderful. Nothing shall stop me from being the richest man in all of California. What are you doing here? When Britt Lohman left, they needed somebody for Henry Calvin to play off of. And it was decided that they would bring Don Diamond on. It's good to have the whole picture, uh, no? And it was almost a combination Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello kind of relationship. And it was genuinely very funny. One, two, three, glide. One, two, three, glide. Fred Cavins was a 72-year-old fencing master choreographer. He had worked with Tyrone Power, Errol Flynn. Almost anybody in Hollywood that ever handled a sword worked with Fred Cavins. He and his son, Albert, choreographed all the scenes on Zorro. Well done, Senor de la Vega. The routines were very similar to what you would see in the swashbuckling films of the 30s and 40s. And that is where a lot of the expense of the show came from. These fencing scenes would often take anywhere from three to five hours to film. One of the things that's impressive about the way they were shot, there were some long routines without the camera stopping. They were really first class. Out of the night when the full moon is bright comes a horse that known as Zorro. George Bruns, who wrote the Zorro theme, spent his entire career as a composer at Disney. A sea that stands for Zorro. Norman Foster's lyrics with George Brun's wonderful, almost Spanish dance-like theme in three-quarter time. It's colorful, it's flavorful, it sets the moment. The, sign of the, sea. Zorro. the record of the Zorro theme wound up in the top 20 on the Billboard charts. Series television in the 1950s often did not have a lot of original music, but Zorro was the exception to the rule in that every single episode had an original score. William Lava composed the scores for all 78 half hours of Zorro and two of the four one hour shows as well. He came to Zorro with a huge background as a Western composer for the Republic serials of the late 1930s and into the early 1940s. William Lava wrote an average of 10 to 15 minutes of music for every episode. He would tend to do it in just a few days, and it was recorded at the Disney scoring stage. One of the wonderful things about the atmospheric music of Zorro 
is the fact that it's often solo guitar. In this case, almost always, Lorindo Almeida, who is probably the greatest acoustic guitarist in the history of the Hollywood studios. <laughs> Zorro was a big win for ABC. The first season, Zorro was getting 38% of the audience. The second season was getting 40% of the audience. Zorro was slated to continue after the second season. Disney was thinking about color. He thought that this was the wave of the future, and ABC was really not involved in color at that time. They got into a long, protracted legal battle, eventually ending with the cancellation of Zorro, the Mickey Mouse Club. What about Zorro? Zorro? As a matter of fact, uh, I don't think I should talk about him. You see, confidentially, Zorro won't be on the show. It was a real unfortunate situation. Here's one of the top-rated shows of all time, and it's pulled off and sits in limbo as the lawyers battle over it for the next year, trying to figure out whether ABC could do without Walt or whether Walt could do without ABC. They did bring him back for four one-hour episodes on Walt Disney Presents. The episodes were actually slated for the third season, but they were put together as one-hour episodes. And they did well in the ratings. So it was kind of a surprise that the Zorro character was kind of left in the past by the studio. Even though Zorro was only on for two seasons, many think it was longer because it was one of the longest syndicated rerun series ever. It was a top-flight production and it was so well made. There's comedy, there's action, there's drama. It's really something that everybody can enjoy. I think the biggest thing that Walt brought to the series was the warmth and the humanity of the characters involved, and I feel that came very much from Walt and his whole approach to story making. We need heroes. We need people with character, integrity, people who think of others first before they think of themselves. Zorro and Don Diego de la Vega were excellent role models for children and for adults on how to genuinely think of others less fortunate than you are. Till we meet again.